morning and welcome to the City Planning Commission remote public meeting. Ryan Singer, who's our Senior Director of Land Use and Commission Operations, is going to outline some general information about the remote public hearing and how to participate. Thank you. Uh, verbal testimony may be provided online through the NYC Engage portal or by calling in on your telephone. If you wish to speak and plan to access the hearing online, please register online through the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. A link to join the hearing is on the landing page after you register. Uh, please do not close the landing page without first clicking on the link. If you're accessing the hearing via phone and wish to speak, you must first register with the dial-in participant hotline um, at the following numbers. If one of the numbers is busy, please try another. The numbers are US toll free, um, 1-877-853-5247, or 1-888-788-0099. Um, we will have these up on the screen in a moment. Uh, there we go. There's all the numbers. Um, I won't read them all out. Um, the meeting ID uh, is uh, 618-237-7396. Press pound to skip the participation ID, and the password is the numeral one. The phone number is posted in the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. Please note that whether you're accessing this meeting online or by phone, you must register if you want to speak. Please also note that the testimony will be audio only. The commissioners will hear you, but will not be able to see you. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified and granted temporary speaking privileges by the staff. So please listen closely for your name to be called. If you're accessing the hearing online, your name will be called from a list of registered speakers. Once your name has been called, you'll be given the temporary ability to unmute uh, yourself and you should see a notice on your screen allowing you to unmute your microphone. If you're accessing the hearing via phone, your name will be called from a list of registered speakers. Once your name has been called, you'll be given the temporary ability to unmute yourself. Uh, you do this by pressing star six to unmute your phone. Please note that the muting and unmuting of registered speakers uh, takes a little, takes a moment. So we'll be adjusting to this new hearing format. Uh, so please have patience. Uh, for those accessing the hearing through the online live stream who have not yet registered to speak, but decide they wish to do so during the hearing, you must first register to speak through the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. It is not possible to speak uh, through the online live stream without first having registered. For those accessing the hearing via phone who have not yet registered to speak but wish to do so, you must first register to speak as well through the dial-in participant hotline that I described a moment ago. It's not possible to testify via telephone without first having registered. <clears throat> Please limit your remarks to three minutes and speak clearly into your microphone. There are a few exceptions to the three minute time limit. Elected officials are accorded the courtesy of jumping to the front of the queue and are not limited to three minutes. If translation services are being used, the time will be extended to five minutes. And if an applicant team with three or more speakers wishes to make a team presentation, the team will generally be allowed a total of 10 minutes. The chair will announce when the time limit is reached at which point your microphone will be muted. Please be mindful of potential background noise during your testimony. Please make sure that you are, that if you're watching the proceedings via live stream, that the live stream is muted when you begin your testimony. Otherwise you will hear an echo. If you wish to submit written testimony, it should be submitted to the Department of City Planning. The mailing and an email address can be found on our website, planning.nyc.gov. Last, lastly, please note that this remote meeting uh, is, and all testimony provided, is being recorded. And with that, I would ask the secretary to please begin the meeting. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, all. This is the New York City Planning Commission public meeting held remotely through the NYC Engage portal. Today is Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020. <clears throat> I will now call the roll. Chair Lago. Here. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Present. Commissioner Bernie. Here. Commissioner Capelli. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. 
Commissioner De La Us. Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Eady. Here. Commissioner Knight. Here. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marine. Commissioner Marine. Here. Here. Noted. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. Commissioner Rapashat. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the public meeting of Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are approved. The next item is scheduling. On calendars numbers one through five, we have resolutions for adoption, scheduling Wednesday, December 16th, 2020, for a remote public hearing to be held through the NYC Engage portal. On the resolutions, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page eight. Reports, Borough of Staten Island, calendar number six, CD3, N210072, RCR. In the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 58 Wheeland Avenue for adoption on calendar number eight. Chair Lago. Yes. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Us. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marine. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rampashad. Commissioner Rampashad. Yes. Yes. Noted. Calendar number six has been adopted. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page nine. Borough of Brooklyn, calendars number seven and eight. CD 12, calendar number seven, C 20007262, ZMK, calendar number eight, N 200063, ZRK. A public hearing in the matter of an application for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning Cinti Avenue rezoning. I would just again remind those who are testifying to limit their remarks to three minutes. And um, Secretary, if you would let folks know when their time begins because of the lags we sometimes have in pulling up the presentations. Will do, Madam Chair. Thanks so much. So uh, the first item where there will be a 10 minute team presentation by an applicant team that is comprised of Richard Lobel, Jack Goldenberg, Isaac Lefkowitz, and Sandy Hornick. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners, Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant, and it's good to see everyone this morning virtually. Um, I'll be starting on the 16th Avenue rezoning presentation. Uh, I will then be joined by Mr. Lefkowitz and Mr. Goldenberg, who as the applicants will discuss the proposed uses at the site. And then Mr. Hornick will address some discrete issues regarding the choice of zoning district uh, here, the C44A. So we have the 16th Avenue rezoning in front of us. Um, I know that the chair brought up former chair Weisbrod in his article this morning. Uh, I note that um, chair Weisbrod was fond of saying that if an applicant wanted to bring jobs to places in the city where people live, they should give city planning a call. And that is the very purpose of this rezoning. The 16th Avenue rezoning would rezone the existing R5 and C22 overlay districts with a C44A permitting a five-story office building to house the, uh, the activities of the tenant. Next slide. So Chartwell Pharmaceuticals would be housed at the property uh, this is a full service manufacturing packaging and related supply chain services organization. 
Uh, they have tremendous experience both in and out of the city. Uh, they currently have a research facility located outside of the city and lease space on 16th Avenue. The idea here would to be to bring jobs, a, a noteworthy goal here in the city. Uh, they would be consolidating existing office workers at 35 employees and potentially <laughs> for a total of 85 employees. The applicant has been searching for the site for over five years. And at the time of purchase, it was occupied by two commercial tenants uh, and one residential tenant, all of whom have vacated. Next slide. So as can be seen from the zoning map, we're an existing R5. I would note that there is an R6A rezoning that was accomplished several blocks to the south of the site. You can see uh, on the upper left-hand portion, the circled area being the area of the proposed project. Uh, you can note the Long Island Railroad cut, which appears in the area. This uh, is populated by C81 and M11 and C82 districts along the cut, uh, including a C81 district directly across from us. So 16th Avenue in this location is, is very dense, it is very commercial, and it is, uh, you know, it is a commercial avenue as opposed to 15th Avenue, which would be more residential and may not be appropriate for a similar project. Next slide. So I would just go to the uh, actual uh, the actual substance of the rezoning, and then I think I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Les Lefkowitz and Mr. Goldenberg. Um, we've got a C44A, which would be mapped 100 feet from 16th Avenue, uh, as well as a C22 overlay, which would be removed from the R5 deeper than 100 feet. Uh, this would um, allow for residential and community facility uses, but not commercial uses further than 100 feet from the avenue, as has been the case with uh, most city planning rezonings. It would uh, reduce the, the uh, additional commercial uses along what is residential side street. And I would just go to the next slide to show land use. Uh, no, it must be a 917 number. And you can see that you will have commercial uses along 16th Avenue. This is generally expected in the area, as, as well as many institutional uses, such as uh, schools. We are immediately adjacent to a police station. Uh, this is 16th Avenue is, a, is an avenue which is central as far as business uh, in this area is concerned. You can see the M11 district two blocks to the south. So we feel that this rezoning is appropriate. I would now um, briefly hand this over to uh, the applicants, Mr. Lefkowitz and Mr. Goldenberg, who can discuss for a couple of minutes the rationale for using this site and then switch it over to Mr. Hornick, who would discuss uh, the choice of a C44A. Isaac, Jack. Hi, this is Jack Goldenberg. So I'm the CEO of, are you hearing us? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, CEO of Tartle Pharmaceutical, a Brooklyn-based uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer um, with operations in Congress, New York. We make uh, RX drugs, many different types of drugs, from flu to anti-infectives to uh, maintenance drugs and all that different stuff. Um, our headquarters is in Brooklyn, New York, Borough Park. We currently have three locations here. And... Uh, we have about uh, 30 people over here in uh, Brooklyn currently at three different locations. And we are looking to hire and uh, consolidate into one location so we can bring in more uh, employees from the local community to, uh, to basically uh, do all the back office and operations of selling the pharmaceuticals in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you. I think we would now uh, introduce Mr. Hornick, who specifically can address issues surrounding C44A and why we felt that this was the minimum district that would permit us to proceed with this program. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Sandy Hornick. I'm an urban planner uh, consulting with uh, Sheldon Lobel PC. Um, most out of borough C4 locations are reflections of where residential neighborhoods did comparison good shopping in the late 1950s. That's how these things got mapped. Um, thus, nearby our site, there's a C42 district along 18th Avenue for three blocks and one along 13th Avenue from 43rd to 52nd Street. These were largely for retail activity and perhaps the occasional local serving attorney or insurance broker. 
very few C4 districts were used for the type of office development that one might expect in a city of 8 million spread over 320 square miles. Those jobs were concentrated in the Manhattan CBD with a small satellite in downtown Brooklyn. Much of today's economic growth is driven by other factors and is important for there to be community-based locations for this growth outside, must, outside of Manhattan. This growth proposal brings with it a locally grown opportunity for job growth, and we believe it is an ideal place to locate such a business opportunity. At present, there's a C2 commercial zone inappropriately mapped to a depth of 150 feet over existing residential uses but reflecting another 1950s preference, this time for willingness to replace over time existing housing with open parking. The site of the proposed development does not, development does not impose on any existing residential uses. It is bordered on both sides by institutional uses, a police station, and it is a, a company parking that dominates the street uh, uh, for several blocks around, and a mikvah. Um, with more institutional and commercial uses across the street in the C8 zone, which itself was rezoned from R5 in 1967. There's an MDUC one district to its west and a proposal to rezone to R5, from R5 to an R6, a 4.6 R7A district, uh, just basically a block away. And that is in ULERP as we speak. It is well served by subway access to the end and D train and other bus service. Um, other com available commercial districts do not provide a realistic opportunity for job growth. C2 districts limit the commercial FAR to two. C43 or C43A districts or C42 districts limit the commercial FAR to three, but perhaps more importantly, um, they impose parking requirements that again are a remnant of earlier thinking and would effectively rule out practical commercial development and equally importantly, inappropriately encourage commuting by automobile. Inclusion, I would uh, uh, encourage the Planning Commission to seize this opportunity to promote economic growth and help Brooklyn realize the city's five borough economic growth objectives. Thank you. So that concludes our presentation and all of the applicant team is happy to take any questions from the commission. Thanks so much. And I am looking to see if there are questions from the commission. Mayor Lago, I, I'm having issues trying to raise my hand. This is Michelle. <laughs> Thanks so much, Commissioner Dillard. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you, I want to kind of delve a little bit more into the, to the job growth potential, since that seems to be part of what you all are underscoring here. So. You said there's 30 to 35 current employees and that there's the potential for growth. Could, could that just be unpacked a bit more? And, um, and you said that you know, the owner's been looking for this site for five years. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to have a, a greater understanding of what exactly the new facility will help the company do that, that it wasn't able to do previously and how that translates into jobs locally. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So currently we have about close to 45 admin jobs currently in our upstate operations, which is where the manufacturing plant is. Um, we are currently developing over there a bigger site. We're adding 60,000 square feet of uh, more square feet of manufacturing suites and all that stuff. Um, having admin uh, over there is for us not conductive because, you know, it's really a manufacturing site and the teams are not cohesively together. So, and most of them travel um, from Brooklyn to upstate. So you plan to relocate them and, you know, have them, have them in one, one site over here in the city. And that includes, by the way, accounting, um, back office, Medicaid, uh, 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 pharmacovigilance, any, any, anything that doesn't have to do really with uh, manufacturing, purchasing, all that stuff. Okay, so it's primarily a relocation of like 45 or so jobs from upstate in, into Brooklyn and moving those admin functions into, into Brooklyn. Well, I would say it's, it's, you know, the existing 30 that's in Brooklyn plus another like 
at least uh, 40. You know, we'll hire some more. Some will stay over there, obviously. Some will need on site uh, as regular uh, maintenance as well and uh, HR. But, you know, we'd like to consolidate the non members that do not need to be on site for manufacturing. And that's really a manufacturing site. So that that's the main purpose of that building. Thank you. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Um, with the um, emergence or creation of uh, up to 45 jobs, I think you said, uh, what would the impact be in terms of parking uh, in the local neighborhood. Um, I know that Sandy noted there was there was uh, there were transportation networks nearby, but nonetheless, won't people be commuting by automobile, especially people who uh, presently are working in uh, the locations in upstate? And if so, what would be the impact of parking their parking on the immediate neighborhood? I would just, it's Richard, I would just start and then and then defer to Mr. Lefkowitz and Mr. Goldenberg, who can probably provide some additional commentary on the, the location of those employees. Um, you know, we understand the, the comment, we understand the, the continued concern, but we also look at this from data and we look at this from, you know, from Borough Park and um, from a from a data-driven standpoint in the environmental assessment statement and the subsequent neg negative declaration, uh, we screened out of this of any additional review for traffic and parking. And it's understandable from my standpoint because um, you know, we're on a, an 80 foot wide street. We're at the intersection of two streets. Access to the site is excellent. Um, you know, we, we just think that having experience in this area and having worked on a number of institutions Particularly of ones that were went through some sort of zoning discretionary approval and were brought before community board 12. Um, you know, there's a lot of, for example, schools, yeshiva, yeshivas in the area where there's, you know, there, there's a hun hundreds of kids who are coming in and, and um, you know, it's understandable that we would have screened down and that this would not have come up as an issue in our environmental review because, frankly, for the controlled number of employees that are going to be coming to the site. I'd say the first thing to note is that it's just, it's really a drop in the bucket here uh, on, a, on a street system, which is really able to handle this type of commercial density. And then I would just defer to Jack and Isaac to talk about the location of the employees who would be working here, as far as where they'd be coming from. Yeah, so if I can address it, please. My name is Isaac Lefkowitz and I live on 57th Street, which is a block from the proposed site. Most of our employees presently, which we rent three offices on 16th Avenue and on 14th Avenue and another office on 58th Street across the street from the proposed site are employees who work at Chartwell at the Brooklyn Bar Park office and live in the area. We're looking to expand new hirees to work both in the IT department, in the admin department and purchasing department now, our CEO, Jack Lefkowitz, and a few of other senior directors, they live in Borough Park, they reside in Borough Park, and they work out of the Borough Park office. It's only going to be efficient and that all of our operations will be under one roof. As far as parking is concerned, our office is a very corporate style office, 8.30 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Most of the parking issues in Bar Park, which I live in, is in the evenings when people commute back from all over outside of the city and they're looking for parking. During the day, there is plenty of parking. I shouldn't say plenty, but there is ample parking around in the area. Uh, and our employees will not use any automobiles. They're all within walking distance. And those few that would come a little bit of outside the area would use uh, public transportation. So we don't think parking is a major issue and we really support this uh, site for our future office. Commissioner Ortiz. No further questions. Thank you, Vice Chair. My question. Commissioner Ortiz. Thank you. My question was asked and answered by Commissioner Knuckles. 
Thank you. Commissioner Eady. Good morning. Um, the borough president um, encouraged the applicant to seek a location that was in an as of right zoning zone district. And, and I understand you indicated that you had searched for five years for a location. Can you talk a little about why this is the right location and why you were unable to find a location in an as of right zoning zone district? District. So our offices are presently on the same avenue, on 16th Avenue. Uh, to go to a different district, uh, anything further than 60th Street is already in an M zone. We would be non-conforming in any event, and the M zone is, is would not allow us the type of space that we need. Uh, originally, we designed this building for 150 employees for future hire which is about 100 square feet per employee. Uh, you know, bear in mind, we started this process with city planning over two years ago. Unfortunately, COVID, the pandemic kicked in and we downscaled it dramatically uh, to limit the building to 50 to 75 employees, which uh, we're gonna use a, a social distancing type of an office environment, especially if we're building it from scratch where it's gonna be a lot more than 200 square feet per employee. Um, there isn't something feasible for us so close to the proximity of walking distance of our existing pool of employees and of our future hirees of the neighborhood, uh, anything in the surrounding area. And if we would have to go anything outside of Brooklyn, uh, we're doing it presently. We're commuting to Congress, New York. So it's defeating our purpose. Uh, so our best use would be this site that we searched since 2015. Uh, it's a site where, even though it's in a residential neighborhood, it really doesn't allow for any res efficient residential building to go up on it because it's a very, very shallow lot. The entire lot is only 66 feet deep. Uh, um, so we figured a, a nice, slick office building uh, not more than five stories, which is contextual with the entire neighborhood, is a perfect fit for the neighborhood and for our use and for our future plan. Uh, can I jump in there a second? This is Sandy Hornick again. Uh, this is what I was trying to get at, which is that the use of C4 districts, which would give you this kind of zoning, is just so limited um, in Brooklyn in general and in the outer boroughs in general and it was basically just concentrated where retail activity was uh, um, in, in the 1950s. And, and the districts that are mapped tend not even to be C44 districts in Brooklyn, they tend to be C42 or C43 districts. So the notion of looking for this uh, appropriate locations that is zoned based on land use conditions in the 1950s is, is a futile exercise. Uh, really, even the M zone, which you know is available and certainly permits the use, is an M11 district. Again, reflecting the thinking of of uh, the 50s that future development would be one-story stuff surrounded by lots of parking, and and that's just not a a, a prescription for economic growth going forward. Any further questions, Commissioner Eady? I'm good, thank you. Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. I was just wondering if the applicant can speak to uh, uh, their uh, involvement, if they've been involved or reached out to the New York City Economic Development Corporation to help them find their location or the, and, and will they be taking advantage of any uh, IDA, Industrial Development Agency benefits, uh, tax exemptions on the build out and fit out of the space? So we have not reached out to EDC and we did not reach out to IDA. Uh, we're fully capitalized and uh, ready to go with our own internal funding to do that. Um, we didn't see, we searched sites through civil, you know, commercial brokers. We hired uh, CBRE and Cushman and Wakefield to search the particular sites for us. Uh, you know, don't forget, this is not something that we can retrofit, uh, you know, any old office. We're building a, a unique 
firewall building. We are in a very unique business, totally controlled by the FDA. Uh, our entire IT department, which is going to be housed in this building, is a very sacred uh, uh, type of a facility. So building something from scratch in New York to find you know, the right economic feasible site um, would have not worked for us, especially if we were looking to address our pool of employees that are within the vicinity. Thank you. Commissioner Perney. Um, yes, I actually had exactly the same question as Commissioner Edy. And I would just also note that uh, Community Board 2 also recommended that we reject this application, as did the Borough President. And I just wonder why your explanation of the difficulty of finding a site and the appropriateness of this particular site uh, did not persuade uh, those at the board and, and the Borough President. So we happened to reach out to the community board chair two years ago. Uh, we first went to the community board in, in an off-site meeting to at his office and it was extremely receptive. Two years passed by. Uh, we actually reached out to all the immediate neighbors, the commercial neighbors across the street, the mikveh behind, behind us, who is extremely receptive to our proposal. Um, the actual community board meeting, the public meeting, we didn't have a chance really to reiterate. And there was residential neighbors that riled up the meeting uh, that it's not safe uh, for an office building to be in the area, although it's exactly next door to the 66 prison. So I don't know why uh, our office as a corporate office would not be safe. It was not a radical type of a meeting and basically community board just um, echoed, you know, the few people that raised their voices at community board to say that uh, the very same thing. Uh, why don't you go look for another site elsewhere? I mean, we have looked for another site elsewhere and it, it didn't work out. Okay, understood. Thank you. That's all. Commissioner Capelli. Uh, yes, the applicant uh, re responded to most of my question from uh, Commissioner Edie's question, however, uh, which had to do with uh, how COVID has affected this uh, proposal. I'm a little unclear as to what the total number of employees are going to be working in the building and how many are going to be working remote uh, going forward if this were to be approved. So... Um... You know, you'll be surprised our facility wasn't shut down for a single day uh, during the entire pandemic. We are considered an essential type of a facility and production of pharmaceuticals. So most of our employees um, commuted to their offices even throughout the height of the pandemic. Um, so this is gonna be a building which will house approximately 75 employees 50% uh, of it existing and 50% of it new hirees. Um, and it's all going to be on site, uh, a consolidation of departments, which is now in three different locations. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, this, is, this would be a, a, a production facility um, and uh, because it is a pharmaceutical production facility, are, uh, is there, um, are there uh, storage requirements uh, that are um, required uh, because of uh, the kinds of products that you produce and uh, what kinds of uh, building uh, equipment and challenges would that present? I mean, this would normally or, or presumably be uh, uh, more regular in a uh, M1 or M2 uh, uh, zoning area. So in this particular facility, if there are production facilities, what kinds of storage issues and, and building uh, requirements are, uh, are presented in this, in this case? No, Commissioner Knuckles, 
Commissioner Knuckles, you, you must have misunderstood. Uh, we are not planning to have any production or manufacturing at the site. It will be a pure uh, class A office building housing our administrative offices, which will uh, accommodate the production facility, which is presently in Congress, New York, and it's being expanded with additional 60,000 square feet. So this is gonna be a pure office building. Thank and you. let me just add to that. It's gonna be, you know, housing admin is, you know, the lab research, uh, you know, pharmacovigilance where we answer patients' calls if they have any questions or doctors, you know, accounting, finance, IT, you know, departments that don't have to be on site, on the production site. And just to give you a little background on Chartwell, um, currently we produce over 3 billion doses just for the US. Um, so we make a pretty big variety of products. So we were not closed at all during the pandemic, but uh, we are very, very essential. We currently make a lot of flu drugs for the current season. And, you know, having admin in production sites is not too uh, ef efficient and you know, you know that's that's the purpose. You know, I live in I, I live by the corner of this building, so I know the place very well. I, I'm from Borough Park, born in Borough Park, and I hired mostly the local people. So, this is the reason uh, we're trying to consolidate all the admin admin items, which includes all these various departments, into one location. Any other questions from the commission? Commissioner Rompershot. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I too was a little unclear about the programming. Uh, I understand you're saying it is going to be a class A office, but in the future down the line, would you guys consider putting production within this facility? No, absolutely not. Thank you. Other questions? In, o in order to make this, sir. Please continue. No, we would just, you know, in order to make this a production site, this would require FDA uh, approval, and the site would uh, wouldn't be would, you wouldn't be able to make commercial offices. It has to be uh, uh, pharma related setups and all that stuff, which it's too small of a site for pharma. The footprint on a single floor, it's all, you know, you need high ceilings in pharma. It's all gravity based. It doesn't work at all for any manufacturing in the pharmaceutical space. Thank you. And seeing no more questions from the commission, I will thank the applicant team. And our next speaker will be David Rosenberg. Good morning, commissioners. This is David Rosenberg, just to um, of Sheldon Lobel PC. Uh, just wanted to follow up on a couple of things from what the applicant team said, particularly with respect to the community board and the bar president recommendations. Um, I know a lot of this has been said, so I'm going to be brief, but just to reiterate a little bit of what the department presented on Monday during the review session, and particularly Community District 12 here is a district that has a disproportionately high number of these kinds of office and sales jobs in it, and a very high number compared to Brooklyn of employees who tend to walk to work which is why we really feel that the C44A district over here, even though some of the residents were concerned about the idea of having a commercial office building, as was mentioned, we have surrounded by other institutional uses and near uh, very other commercial corridors along 60th Street and up and down 16th Avenue. This is particularly appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Questions from the commission? Thank you for your testimony. I um, will note that we are getting near to the end of folks who have signed up to speak at the public hearing. So if you haven't registered to speak yet, but you've decided during the course of the hearing that you'd like to, um, now is the time to register. And again, you can find instructions on how to register, whether online or by phone, 
at www.nyc.gov slash NYC Engage. And with that, I'll call our next speaker. Hi, I'm David. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Mr. David. Good morning, my name is Chaim David. So I live in Bar Park. I'm employed at Chartle Pharmaceutical from Congress New York since 2015. I had the IT and lab department at Chartwell. I manage over 20 employees who commute daily in like 90 minutes on a good day. As we expand our hiring, we have encountered in the past many quality prospective employees from the Bar Park area who decline to commute. So this new proposed office site will help us in our local job growth. So I totally support this application. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Thank you, Mr. David. Our next speaker is Shavi Schwartz. Hi, do you hear me? Hi, good morning. Yes. My name is Shavi Schwartz. So I live on 59th Street, that's a block away from the proposed site, and I am employed at Charwell Pharmaceutical since 2018. I had the accounting department and I manage over 25 employees. This new proposed site will help us stabilize our jobs, you know, and it'll definitely uh, affect the future hirees as we are expanding. I definitely support this application. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Schwartz. Thank you for your testimony. And I'll now ask whether any other folks have registered to speak. No, this, let me give one moment for the this uh, page to update. No, no further sp speakers have signed up for this item. Thank you. So this public hearing is closed. Our next item, Borough of Queens, calendar numbers nine and 10. CD2, calendar number nine, C200303, ZSQ, calendar number 10, N200304, ZRQ. A public hearing in the matter of applications for a special permit and a zoning text amendment concerning 42-11 9th Street special permit. This is going to be a team presentation, a 10 minute team presentation, and it is quite a large applicant team. It's comprised of Emma Manson, Carlos Escobar, Carl Orderman, Ellen Lehman, Brian Weinberg, Will Warren O'Brien, Rachel Belsky, Michael Rem, Justin Lapatine, Melanie Myers, and Adhan Pasha. And please feel free to be Thank you for having us, uh, commissioners. My name is Carlos Escobar, and I am the president of Titan Machine. And uh, although that is a very long list of co-presenters, um, actually, I'm, I'm only co-presenting with Michael Rem and Emma Manson, and the rest of the team from Freed Frank, Perkins Eastman, Langan, uh, and GSG are here to uh, help answer questions afterwards. Um, so I thought I'd begin by telling you a little bit about our company, the changes we've seen, and some of the, uh, the rationale behind our partnership with RxR. And then uh, I'd like to hand it over to Michael so they can give you some more details about the project. So Titan Machine was founded by my father in uh, 1973. And uh, we've been members of the neighborhood since. Um, we've been at this particular location since 1998. And we currently employ about 20 employees um, we are a manufacturing company. We make elevator parts. We like to say that we make all the mechanical components that you don't see when you're riding in the elevator. Um, but over the years, the industry has changed. Manufacturing, as you guys can imagine, has also changed quite a bit. Um, we've gone from being a, a relatively high volume, low margin manufacturer to transitioning to more of a lower volume, higher margin manufacturer. Um, and that, that requires a change in equipment. 
And uh, while we are um, a, a fairly small company with only 20 employees, those employees have been with us for, in many cases, nearly 30 years. Um, so the goal would be to reinvest in ourselves, retrain our employees, uh, purchase some new equipment so that we can more rapidly produce these smaller batch orders. Um, and also, we, we, I, I think the, the partnership with ArcSAR allows us to, uh, uh, I guess, highlight our interest in maintaining, preserving, and even expanding the industrial character of the neighborhood that's been so good to us, our employees, my family. Um, so that's always been really important to us. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I guess I'll, I'll hand it over to Michael to give you some more details about uh, the project. I think we should actually Thank be you, on Carla. slide three at this point. Yeah, if we can advance two slides to slide three, I'll tell you uh, a bit about RxR. Uh, RxR is a New York-based, vertically integrated real estate firm uh, with a very long history in New York, uh, and we've got a commitment to the city's future as well. Our operational ethos is doing good while doing well means doing better. And that leads us to develop strong partnerships and support the communities where we work. We bring experience developing and operating mixed use buildings outside Manhattan and in this neighborhood in particular. We have owned and operated standard motor products building on Northern Boulevard since 2014, which is a home to a mix of industrial, creative, and office tenants. We are also the developers of The Hall, a mixed use property near the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we own and operate uh, the historic mixed, mixed use stare at Lehigh building on Manhattan's west side. On the next slide, you'll see the current uh, M14 site is a one and a half story building on a 49,000 square foot footprint. The building includes about 45,000 square feet of industrial space and 10,000 square feet uh, of accessory office. On the next slide, to tell you a bit about the new project, uh, it is a new ground up commercial and industrial development. The 21 story, 400,000 gross square foot building includes three stories of required industrial space and 18 stories of office with off street bike and vehicle parking and loading. The building also includes 3,000 retail, uh, 3,000 square foot retail space on the corner of 10th street, as well as streetscape improvements and a landscape public open space. The project requires a ULERP to apply the industrial business incentive area zoning. Emma? Thanks, Michael. On the next slide, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on the building's design. The project is really designed to combine a mix of industrial and commercial uses while improving the public realm consistent with the goals of the IBIA program. So in right, you'll see how this works from the ground floor up. Here we have separate pedestrian and vehicle loading entrances on 9th and 10th Street. 10th is on the bottom of the slide. There are separate industrial and office lobbies. There are interior loading berths to support the uses, below grade parking, the corner retail that Michael mentioned, as well as landscaping on 10th Street and Queens Plaza South. That green area you see is an almost 5,000 square foot landscape public plaza. The goal here is really to harmonize the flows of uses in the building and have something that can support for all of the businesses and employees. On the next slide, you'll see a stacking plan that further highlights how this zoning is really designed to promote a mix of uses and create jobs in Long Island City. The industrial base is shown in blue at right. Tenants in that base are required to fall within a limited set of certain industrial uses. And this space is around 70,000 square feet, which is 55% more than exists in the building today. It's really important to note that this is real industrial space that's built to different specs than the office tower. It's 20 uh, feet slab to slab floor heights as opposed to I think around 14 in the office. It has 150 pounds of square foot live load and there are two dedicated 6,000 pound freight elevators. And these are specs that are consistent with other new construction industrial space in the city. This is also a job generating project. We're anticipating that we'll create around 1500 permanent jobs compared to Titan's 21 jobs on site today. Around 300 to 350 of those will be industrial jobs and the balance will be office. And for us, it's really important that this project brings both industrial and office jobs to a location outside Manhattan. As a mixed use project in Long Island City, the project supports the city's 100,000 jobs plan as well as the 10 point industrial plan by increasing this job density and providing walk to work commutes for residents of Long Island City. On um, the next slide, it's RxR and Titan's goal that this economic opportunity really is available to our neighbors and residents of Long Island City and Queens. 
To that end, we've already worked to develop the strong partnerships Michael talked about to connect residents to the 300 construction jobs and those 1,500 permanent jobs. On the construction side, we are very lucky and grateful to be working closely with Urban Upbound and LaGuardia Community College on construction skills training programs that will result in real credentials, real and transferable credentials that will prepare Queensbridge residents to work both on our site and other sites in the future. We're also working with On Point Security, which is a Queensbridge-based worker co-op to provide job site security. On the permanent side, while the majority of the permanent jobs are created by our tenants, we've started early conversations with LaGuardia Resettlement House and planned conversations with other local anchor institutions to think of creative ways to provide connections, intermediaries, and pathways to employment at the site. For the permanent jobs that, you know, other permanent jobs like building service workers, we're working with 32BJ on those service jobs. Next slide, please. The zoning, we're seeking the zoning text amendments to apply the industrial business incentive area zoning, specifically the text amendments to designate the site as an IBIA and the associated special permits that facilitate the project. As we advance through ULERP, we are very grateful to have the community board and the borough president's support. We understand the motivation behind the conditions that they've suggested, and we look forward to continuing our conversations during the ULERP process to ensure that the project delivers on its potential. And on the next slide, to summarize, <laughs> RxR and Titan are really excited about what this project brings to the neighborhood and to Queens. And you know, to put it all together, this is a job creating project that brings local jobs and commercial development to Long Island City. It also brings a new industrial space, expanding the ground floor industrial character and creating an increase over what exists today. It's designed for a mix of uses and to improve the public realm, particularly the pedestrian experience along Queens Plaza and 10th Street. We are working hard to build strong partnerships to the opportunities at the site. And we believe that in RxR and Titan, there is a high quality development team and a long-term partnership between a local business and a best-in-class developer that's sensitive to the community needs. And with that, we are, you know, thank you for having us and we look forward to questions. And so I will toss it to the commissioners if there are questions. Commissioner Rumpershot. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, with regards to the recommendations by the community board, uh, where it says the developer will set aside 10% of industrial space at a rental rate of $15 per square foot, uh, has there been any further discussion or thought of where that space would be located? Yeah, you know, well, just candidly, we're not sure that a fixed set aside or a fixed rent cap is the right way to achieve that goal, but we certainly share the community's goal of making sure that the building is accessible to the diverse range of businesses in the neighborhood and particularly the industrial businesses. The building, you know, and we've designed a building that works because we are anticipating to lease the industrial space at lower than office rents. The building works as a coherent whole where we're able to achieve average building ride rents that enable us to bear the costs of new construction. And so any fixed cap does make it more difficult or places constraints on those economics. So it's something that we you know, are working through and discussing. Commissioner Levin. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I have... Um... I guess I had, I had two questions that I put out there yesterday uh, at the review session on Monday and they kind of go in two different directions. One is if um, Mr. Escobar could tell us a little bit more about um, Titan's relocation plans, whether you've identified uh, space um, to move and whether it's gonna be nearby and another kind of job generator perhaps for this uh, neighborhood. Um, and then for RxR, a question about your um, uh, strategy for locating um, and securing industrial tenants. Uh, what kind of tenants do you imagine taking this space? Great. Carlos, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the predominantly um, our business comes from the five boroughs and kind of the, the New York metro area, the Northeast corridor. Um, something like 60% of our revenue comes from this region. Um, so remaining in Queens specifically, and then the outer boroughs more broadly is our goal. We haven't identified a space, although um, it, it's difficult to do so, um, being that we don't really have a set date. Uh, this process leaves a lot of ambiguity. So it, there's not 
I can't really step into a negotiation uh, either to purchase or lease space without having some set um, some set date, uh, dates in place. Um, so I think that answers your okay, question. Okay, yeah. Um, in looking for um, alternate space, are you imagining, um, uh, hoping to find space that will allow you to expand your operations? Is this an expansion move for Titan as well as uh, Long Island City jobs in general with the big project? Well, our, um, the, the, the 20, 21 or so mm -hmm. employees that we've had, like I said, a, a lot of them are pushing 30 years. Um, some of them have been with the company since I was you know, two feet tall. Um, uh, that said, it, it, our growth is probably more in the technology that we employ to produce our products. So we operate equipment that, you know, frankly, some of it's from World War II. Um, our, our employees, they're, I mean, crooked, you know, craftsmen, to call them craftsmen seems like an understatement, um, what they can do with this equipment. Um, but modern manufacturing requires some rapid prototyping, some more, you know, far more expensive CNC equipment and retraining that existing workforce. Um, so is an expansion move? Yes, in the sense that we intend to produce smaller batches of higher margin items, but I, I don't see us employing far more than, than the existing workforce that we have now. In fact, we'd probably be look, looking for a smaller footprint. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then- Commissioner Bernie. Um, there was another question, which we can certainly defer, but about the strategies for um, locating and uh, securing industrial tenants for the new building. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah. Commissioner. Lund. Absolutely. Um, you know, with, as with all of our projects, we take a multi-pronged approach here, and I think particularly so because the use is so important and also so distinct. We plan on, you know, we work with brokers to lease our buildings. In this case, we'd also leverage our strong relationships with tenant side brokers and buildings that we already operate. We had experience working both with our tenant networks at Standard Motors and Stare at Lehigh, as well as with local bids and community groups. We've obviously done a lot of work, you know, have been in Long Island City for a long time and have strong partnerships. And we'd like to work through all of those channels to identify companies. And then to your question about kind of types of industrial businesses, we really see this as squarely in line with the future of the industrial sector, you know, what we've seen in leasing in the city. So it's a combination of light manufacturing, potentially rapid, rapid prototyping and machinery, places that have a reason to locate in a mixed use district. Um, and we're also excited about potential synergies between some of the office tenants and some of the production tenants. Thank you. Commissioner Bernie. Oh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, 5,000 square foot public open space. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, what, how it will be used, how it will be managed and where it is? Yeah, the space itself, I'll start and then I think I might hand it over to Carl Ordeman of Perkins Eastman who can answer more of the design questions. That the space itself is on the 10th street entrance of the building, which is closer to the approach from the two subway stations as well as two of the city bike stations. It's where the office lobby is. And we've achieved this by pulling back the building a bit from the sidewalk. And the idea is that it will be a landscape space with furniture. We've heard from the community that they're eager to have some public art there. And we've made a, you know, our plan is to work closely with a local arts group, community group or nonprofit to identify appropriate artists and art to feature. And then Carl, if you have anything to add on the particular design considerations, please speak up. Uh, hello, Commissioner Bernie, Carl Ordeman, I, we would be, expanding the existing 15 foot uh, sidewalk by adding another 15 foot uh, landscape segment between the property line and the face of the building that goes up. The corner along Queens Plaza South and 10th Street would have a retail facility that in favorable weather and post COVID of course would be spilling out onto that as well with some outdoor seating if there's some venue that would support uh, expansion out into the open. We envision some artwork from the community selection uh, to be placed there, to be uh, more of an enlivened space. The particular entrance on 10th Street is for the office building uh, uh, component. We've uh, secluded that from 9th Street where the uh, parking entrance and where the loading dock entrance is, as well as the um, industrial component. So it's gonna be an, a, a landscape, well-lit, uh, well-maintained well uh, strip of doubling the size of the sidewalk. We're also, as an aside, we're adding another uh, 
expanding the Queens Plaza South Sidewalk from I think nine foot eight to fifteen by adding more uh, there to set the building back. We're stepping back on two of the three sides. Right. Do you know? Is there any adjacent um, retail or food outlet around there? Not necessarily in your building, but close by. There's not much in the way of um, local retail within the next block or so. You'd need to take a bit of a walk, but you're close to the subway station and this whole community is developing, as you know. Sounds like a food truck opportunity to me. Yeah. yeah we, we've heard from um, April at the Queensbridge Houses that an ice cream store would be appreciated. I was thinking ice cream or pretzels, as you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but also candidly, we think there might be some opportunity to have that be a storefront either for a ground floor manufacturing use or to benefit from the production space as well. So we're excited about it. Okay, good, thank you. Commissioner Delos. Um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, it's a very interesting project. Um, 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 you know, kind of given the community board's uh, comments about rents and uh, the development team's understanding of um, what the community is trying to highlight in, in terms of industrial rents, but not necessarily agreeing on the strategy. I think it would be, um, it would be helpful to hear, hear two things. One is um, for your underwriting assumptions, um, you know, what, what are your assumptions on the, on the commercial and industrial rents? And then what, what strategies are you thinking might be appropriate to address the community's concerns? Great, thank you. We, you know, our model for the building is firmly based in a difference between industrial tenants and commercial tenants and from designing the space to accommodate different uses with very specific different built elements to a difference in rents. And on the industrial side, we've been underwriting to an average of $25 a square foot, which is you know around 40 to 60% less than the commercial rents. The really important thing for us here is that this is an average throughout the entire building and that we're delivering a new construction building in Queens that we hope will be able to attract local businesses in both the industrial and office components. We're you know, very supportive of the IBIA program, which does limit the uses that can go in the first three floors in the building, and which will require us to find a series of really great and quote unquote real industrial tenants. We are looking forward to partnering with bids, local groups, the industrial community in New York City to find great tenants for that. But at this point in time, given how far in advance we are of both constructing the building, financing and leasing, having firm caps on particular space just you know, adds constraints that might down the road make it difficult for us to lease to particular tenants or to provide a range of rents that get to that average. So primary the strategy, um, well, one, one, I mean, those underwriting assumptions, um, I mean, I think they seem in line, certainly with what I understand to be going on at Industry City, uh, certainly at, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, probably uh, a range there. Yeah. Um, and, and so primarily the strategy is to do a broad outreach to see who can, who would take advantage of rents at that, at that amount. Absolutely. Um, do you have an idea of, Oh, I, I just want to, I'm just to wondering though, kind of going back to the, the, you know, the traditional industrial, uh, I, do you, do you believe that the more traditional industrial uses could afford the $25 a square foot? I think that might be a question I'd wanna to give to Carlos as a quote unquote, very traditional industrial user. Before I do that, I, you raised two points that I probably could have highlighted more. The first is that we, that $25 rent number is indeed consistent with our understanding at new construction industrial space throughout the city, including something like the Navy Yard that actually gets a city subsidy. And it's also consistent with what we see at Standard Motors in the same neighborhood and that mix, which is why we felt confident going out with that. The second is that one thing we heard from the community that also we heard from them in our design phase, and it's why it's incorporated, is that we have a variety of sizes of industrial space. So on the ground floor, we have a couple of spaces that are under 5,000 square feet, which is very difficult to find and particularly difficult to find on the ground floor of the building. So we're trying to, you know, preserve multiple avenues for supporting the industrial sector in Long Island City and attract different businesses. Um, and then we do think 
you know, certainly from our perspective at Standard Motors and what we see happening at the Navy Yard, Industry City, and BAT, and GMDC, that there are businesses that have a very deep connection to New York City, whether it's their markets, their employees, their staff, um, or the kind of types of products they're producing. Carlos, I don't know if you want to elaborate a bit. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, I think, uh, I guess, bluntly, uh, Titan as is would not, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be the company that, that would uh, I've lost you. And a very good point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see there. <laughs> I, I think the point is that we then become the company that would, if it weren't for the expense of moving twice, which is you know probably near a million dollars for us each way, um, we'd love to move back into this modern space. He cut out. I couldn't hear what he said. Perhaps as Mr. Escobar tries to reconnect, um, I'm, Commissioner Delo is going to have more questions. Oh, yes. Welcome back. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I, I, I don't know where I got cut off, but the point I was trying to make is that um, in reinvesting in our equipment and our folks, um, I think that we become the company that would be able to move back into that space at $25 a square foot and pay the premium for modern industrial space, uh, for the freight elevators, the off street loading, um, and then potentially, you know, whatever space may be available for offices above and so forth. Um, so, um, it's, I guess a twofold answer. I think the kind of industrial manufacturing companies that you want in the space would pay the premium to be there. Thank you, I, pre I appreciate that answer. Commissioner Lund. Uh, yes, thank you for giving me another swing. Um, I have um, uh, questions about the building design and I wonder, uh, wonder what uh, sustainable design features, if there's anything special about this building from a sustainability standpoint that you'd like to highlight for us. Um, and also a question about bike parking. Um, this is really a prime location for um, people working in the building to be able to commute by bike. And it strikes me that 67 accessory bike parking spaces is just a drop in the bucket for what the demand might be. So I'm wondering if um, there are alternate plans, whether this will be the kind of modern office space where um, employees will be able to bring their bikes um, up to the floors on which they work or how we're gonna deal with um, uh, bike parking in an efficient way. Great, thank you. Um, I'll start by answering bike parking and then Carl will address the sustainability and design features. So we, you know, we're an office operator in, in much of the city and we know that biking to work is incredibly important and something that most tenants these days demand. So it was important to us that it be included in the building. The initial plans do have a bike parking room on the ground floor. Uh, that's sized to accommodate what we think will be the initial demand in the building. We, you know, it's also a built to suit program. So the benefit for tenants is that they can design their interior spaces to also accommodate a wide range of uses, including parking. We are constantly striving to be responsive to our tenants and their needs. So if as we're leasing or as they're fitting out, we hear that there's a demand for additional space in the building, we'd work to accommodate it with them. The other thing that we're excited about, though it's not in the building, is our proximity to city bike stations as well as walking distance to Queens Plaza and the Queensbridge staff. And then I'll turn it over to Carl. Thank you, Emma. Uh, there are other opportunities for us to, if the demand arises, to have bike parking uh, both below grade and on in the rear of the building. But also we have the ability with two freight elevators to bring your bike to work and park it next to your workstation. So answer to that question earlier is yes. With regards to sustainability, we're uh, being fully energy compliant with all the new requirements. We changed the uh, mechanical electrical design when the um, local law 97 came out. The materials that we're using are sustainable. The energy system to heat and cool the building is sustainable. We may not be going for LEED certification, but I can assure you that the design is fully sustainable. Okay, and what, so, um, I mean, I realized LEED certification is, uh, you know, that's a 
a whole separate conversation um, and is sometimes not uh, worth the um, administrative challenges of pursuing. But if you were to check off the boxes on the leads chart, what level of um, leads, um, what lead level might you achieve here? We'd probably be in low silver. Um, we have a community bicycles being one and the energy system for the HVAC. We have good points. Okay. Uh, the exterior wall materials are, are solidly in, within the range. We're in good shape. We don't have solar panels or gray water, but we've checked off most of the other boxes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Then thank you to the applicant team. And we will now turn to members of the public, beginning with Jonathan Bowles. Hello. Good morning. Hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. I don't see myself. Um, Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bowles. I'm the executive director of the Center for an Urban Future, which is an independent think tank focused on creating a more inclusive economy in New York and expanding economic opportunity for all New Yorkers. <clears throat> Our recent reports have explored the opportunity to expand apprenticeship programs in New York, the importance of scaling up effective tech training programs, <coughs> excuse me, and the need to boost supports for community college students. We've also written extensively about the importance of manufacturing jobs in New York. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm testifying in favor of this project for a number of reasons, but mostly because this city was facing a good jobs crisis long before the coronavirus pandemic. And I believe this project would pave the way for a lot of new good jobs, both in the manufacturing sector which is still one of the most important sources of middle-class jobs for New Yorkers without a college degree, but also in the office sector, which now accounts for the overwhelming majority of well-paying jobs that are growing in the city's economy. Supporting manufacturing jobs today requires embracing innovative financing mechanisms like this one. In the last couple of decades, there have been only a small handful of new industrial buildings developed in New York and nearly all of the ones that have been developed are in the city-owned Brooklyn Navy Yard or have been built by nonprofit developers like GMDC using extensive public subsidies. But as much as I love the manufacturing component of this development, I think the new offices will ultimately create even more opportunities for living wage jobs for lower income residents of this community and throughout Queens. Right before the pandemic, 83% of office jobs in the city were in Manhattan. Growing more of these jobs in Queens would lead to more jobs and internships for local residents and more training partnerships with local educational institutions. Some don't think the office sector will help New Yorkers from lower income communities. I don't think we have a choice. Where good paying jobs have been growing in the city, it's almost entirely been in the office sectors. That was the case in the years before the pandemic and it's absolutely the case in these past nine months. Manufacturing jobs are still vital sources of middle-class jobs in New York. There just aren't enough of them left in New York to be the primary focus of our efforts to lift New Yorkers out of poverty. And the economic data shows that they haven't been growing at all, even in recent years when the rest of the city's economy was booming. I'm convinced we need other strategies to move low-income New Yorkers into good jobs. One of those strategies should be to nurture the well-paying jobs that are already growing rapidly in New York and simultaneously increase I'm efforts to make those industries more inclusive. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Thank you. I'm afraid the time is up, but I will now turn it over to questions from the commission. Thank you for your testimony. I'll note now that we are getting near the end of the public hearing on this matter. And if you haven't registered to speak, but have decided during this course of this hearing that you'd like to speak, um, now would be the time to register. And again, you can find instructions on how to register, whether online or via phone at www.nyc.gov, slash 
NYC Engage. And with that, I will turn to our next speaker, Seth Bornstein. Are we able to connect Mr. It Bornstein? That Mr. Bornstein is using an older version of, um, of Zoom. And it's telling me I cannot um, allow him to speak. Uh, do we, can we um, reach out to him? I'll have production reach out to him and we'll, um, We'll perhaps get him on the phone. We'll have him dial in. So if we want to go to the next speaker, we can can do that. Good. Thank, thank you for the suggestion. We'll then ask Charles Yu. Looks like Mr. Yu is no longer in the room. Um, we don't have any other other speakers, but um, if you want, we can take a, a, a quick break and we'll try to get Mr. Bornstein in um, on a, via the dial-in. Do you want to set up? I could ask. Yes, if we could just ask the commissioners to abide for a few minutes um, as we try to get Mr. Bornstein reconnected. Sure. Production, could you could you display the um, this call in um, the dial in numbers, please, Mr. Mr. Bornstein? Could you leave the meeting and then call in with with um, this these uh, these numbers? The first one should work. Also, Mr. Bornstein, their staff is emailing you. So if you could check your email, um, they, can, they can get you into the meeting quicker.
Okay. Um, it appears that we have. Hello. 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 Yep, there we go. Good morning. I should be on it. And uh, cut off one of the Hello. mics. Yes, yeah. welcome. Yes. Welcome to. Yes, do you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. My name is Seth Bornstein. I'm the executive director of the Queens Economic Development Corporation. And our mission is to create and retain jobs in Queens County for over 40 years. Um, in doing so, we work with a lot of developers, a lot of different projects. Um, this project is one that we really support because it's totally in keeping what we'd like to see in the borough of Queens. Uh, when I met with the uh, Taishan folks over a year ago, uh, it was a good project we supported then. Now it's even more important, I believe, in light of uh, what's happening in the city and especially Queens. Uh, the fact is there really isn't a lot, is not a lot of commercial industrial development in the whole borough at this point. Um, to see this happen is a great example. It could be a model for other mixed-use projects in the borough of Queens and other hubs. So um, we really support this. It's uh, creating jobs, creating a commercial space, and also improving the, the uh, landscape of that area, which is right now uh, in a bit forlorn. Uh, so we hope it will be a catalyst for the development in the community. Um, with that, we fully support it, and uh, thank you for letting me speak this morning. I'm glad we were able to connect. And uh, yes, thank I'd... you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, any, any, any questions from me? Yeah, any questions from the commission? Well, then, thank you for sticking with us, Mr. Bornstein. I'm glad that we could hear your testimony. Yes, thank you very much. Take care now, folks. Bye. And Ryan, I would ask if any other speakers have signed up. Um, checking the um, list. No, there's no further speakers signed up on this item. Okay, thank you. Then this public hearing is closed. And I would ask the secretary if there's any other business before the commission. Uh, Chair Lago, there is a, a housekeeping matter, uh, if I may. Please. Uh, for those of you that were unable to or did not wish to testify, you can submit written testimony online by selecting this hearing on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal through DCP's webpage or by mailing your comment to City Planning Commission, Calendar Information Office, 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. Thank you. And with that, the public meeting, this remotely held public meeting is adjourned. Thank that you. concludes today's public Definitely. meeting of the City Planning Commission. Thank the you. The time is 11.24 a.m. Stay well. Bye. Everyone stay Bye. safe. Bye. 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 Bye.